Nicolas Flamel, scene one, take 1340. Action. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the History and Mystery channel. We're a new YouTube channel that's gonna explore the more mysterious things of the past. If that's something you're interested in, please like and subscribe. So, now that we told that, let's get back to the video. I'm your host, The Chronicler, and today I want to delve into the story of Nicholas Van Mel. It's a name that the Harry Potter fans among you probably already heard of. So, the main questions we have today are, who was Nicholas Van Mel? What did he do during his lifespan? How did he become so obsessed with alchemy? Did he create the Philosopher's Stone? And last but not least, where is he now or where are his bodily remains? Nicholas Flamel used to be an alchemist, who some claim is still alive, because according to legend, he's the one that created the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone is an alchemical substance that is claimed to be able to turn base metals into silver or gold. It is also said that it could be used to create the elixir of life, because the stone is also useful for rejuvenation, which is a medical discipline focused on the practical reversal of the aging process. And that's how Nicholas supposedly has attained the ability to become immortal. But before we talk more about that, we have to go back to the beginning and the start of his life. Nicholas van Mel was born around 1340 in the city of Pontois, which is now located in the suburbs of Paris. We don't know much about his early life, but what we do know is that he survived in his younger years the Black Death epidemic of 1348, which was one of the most deadly epidemics in Europe, and which claimed the lives of approximately one third of the European population. We also know that he was married to a woman named Paranel, and for Paranel it was her third marriage, because she had already widowed two times before. We also know that Flamel used to work as a scribe and a manuscript seller in a small shop in Paris, which was now located next to the Tour saint jacques Besides selling, he was also writing volumes of books, which was a big deal at the time, because most people back then didn't even know how to read or write. It is still unknown how he precisely learned it, but we could guess that he probably received some education either in a university or a private institution. During his lifetime, also the 100-year war between England and France was happening. And during his later years, he also witnessed the French civil war between the Armagnacs and the Bourguignons. So, now that we sketched an understanding of the man, who he was and what kind of a period he lived in, we're gonna delve into the mysteries surrounding him. One day, Nicolas Flamel had a mysterious dream in which an angel came to him and handed him a book with a distinctive cover. It looked old, with thick pages and with copper fastenings. This was something pretty unusual, because most books in the Middle Ages were made of wood and leather. So, just by looking at it, he knew this meant something special. So naturally, he tried to grab the book, but the angel wouldn't let him. And I quote, the angel said, One day you will see in it, which no other man will be able to see. When he heard those words, he woke up and he became a man with a mission, a man who became obsessed with finding this book. So he started looking for it and searching for it. And he would just hope that it would just appear or arrive in his shop. Weeks went by without result. But one day in 1357, a strange man walked into his shop with a mysterious book, a book that instantly catched Nicholas' eyes and which, when he got a better look at it, and he knew it. That was the book from his dreams. He asked the man what his prize was, and the man said, two florins, and it's yours. Nicholas gave the man two florins and started investigating the book. The book was made of bark instead of pepper, which was something pretty unusual for the time. It had 21 pages, and it was divided in three segments of seven pages. The last page of every segment contained a mysterious painting. The book was mostly written in Hebrew and filled with strange symbols. But thanks to his experience as a scribe, he started putting the pieces of the puzzle together and realized that this book 
was describing how to turn lead into gold. This became a changing point in his life. He devoted the remainder of his life to alchemy and putting the theory from the book into practice. But if he wanted to understand more of the knowledge that the book was holding, he had to translate it, because Nicholas didn't spoke or read Hebrew. So his next mission was looking for somebody that could translate the book. And after 21 years of searching, he ended up in Spain. And the next problem came. The book stated that only a priest or a scribe was allowed to read the book and all others would be cursed. So nobody wanted to read and translate it for him. After this setback, he decided it was time to go back to Paris. But on his journey home, he heard whispers of the name Metra Gans. Metra Gans was a Catholic who grew up Jewish and knew the mystical Jewish philosophy of Kabbalah. Nicholas found out where Metra lived and he visited Metra Gans in Lyon and learned that his book was legendary in the alchemy society. Metra Gans told Nicholas everything he knew and offered to help him. But during the journey to Paris, Metra Gans died. But fortunately, Nicholas learned everything from Metra that he needed to know. When Nicholas arrived back in home in Paris, he started to decipher the book and slowly started putting all the pieces together. And on April 25th, 1382, he wrote, and I quote, I made a projection of the Philosopher's Stone upon half a pound of mercury, which I transmuted into about the same quantity of pure gold. Most certainly better than ordinary gold, more soft and more pliable. After this discovery, he started making generous donations, financed 14 hospitals and even built three chapels. This caused him to end up in the spotlight and even Francis King Charles the six started to notice. We're not sure what happened between him and the king, but he was never investigated for fraud, theft, or any other crime. Later in his life, when he started getting older, he became obsessed with his own death. He bought a lavish gravestone that had a display on it of three wise men with hollows around their head. They were posing with a key, a star, and a mysterious container with a cross on top of it. As far as we know, these references all have a symbolic meaning in alchemy, but unfortunately we don't know precisely what it means. Maybe it were some secret messages that still have to be decoded. Besides the gravestone, he also made a testament and would donate most of his wealth to charity and give his nephew a generous amount of wealth. For a man who was claimed to be immortal, he certainly spent a long time thinking about his death. And as if he knew it was coming, he died just when he finished all his planning. After an interesting life, Nicholas found his last resting place next to his wife, who had already deceased long before him. His grave was located in a cathedral next to the bookstore that he used to work in. A few months after his death, all kinds of rumors started to spread that he wasn't dead because he created the Philosopher's Stone and used it to make the elixir of life. Because of all these rumors that Nicholas and his wife Paranel faked their own death, a priest decided that it was time to prove to the people that they were really dead, so that he could put an end to all these rumors. The priest then made the decision to hire a bunch of grave robbers. And during the night, they slipped into the cathedral, opened the tomb, and were shocked when they found out it was empty. If this is true, and they did not find his body, then the question remains, where is he or where are his bodily remains? His body is not claimed to be found or buried anywhere else. But there are stories that claim that he was still alive much longer than after his claimed demise. One of these claims was made during the 18th century by a researcher named Paul Lucas. He met a man who claimed to be friends with Nicholas and his wife. He also claimed that they were still alive and if this is true, it would mean that the couple would be more than 300 years old. Another theory about the story was later made by a journalist who claimed that the so-called friend of Nicholas was actually Nicholas himself in disguise. But as expected, nobody could find this friend again to ask his side of the story. Not much later, after Paul Lucas published the story, another mysterious figure started to show up at the finest parties and at the tables of high-ranking people this man was the Count of Saint-Germain, but that's a story for another day. 
I want to thank you guys for listening. Hope you enjoyed, enjoyed the video. I'll see you later.